<laughs> it's the wonder of nature, baby! Good evening, everybody. It is Thursday, the Thursday before the Thursday before Easter, and welcome to Unplugged. Yes, and we're just gonna we're gonna silence the battle cry of freedom by the Eighth Illinois String Band, which. Yeah, I'm glad I found that version through the YouTube Creator Studio. Uh, the other ones that were completely free, they I didn't like them. They, yeah, I I guess you get what you get what you pay for, which is you're paying nothing. You're paying nothing. Welcome to the 54th installment of Uncut History, and joining us is Maji Chan. Thank you for joining. As Bernert is joining us also, and we of course have the ghost of Howard's right arm here to haunt us and remind us of the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> uh, you're probably wondering why I'm in this coat. So I don't know why this has happened this week, but I kind of just started reminiscing about. The very brief period of time when I was into NASCAR, and when I mean very brief moment, I'm talking the before times, before Little Readout Productions got bitten by the historical bug and dumped all of his money into expensive period co correct equipment to a simpler time when I was like four years old and like playing with match cars, you know. NASCAR match cars. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know why this happened, but this is where we live now, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But our main topic tonight is actually going to be a situation developing with the Manassas National Battlefield. Uh, just a brief blur before we go into all of our juicy details. There is going, there's the chance, a very massive chance, that the world's largest data center is going to be built adjacent to the present park boundaries. And what I mean by world's largest, I mean three miles long of urban sprawl going to be right against the historic skyline where the first major land battle of the American Civil War occurred. So we're going to be talking about all of that and how entities such as the American Battlefield Trust are trying to combat this situation. But first, the jacket. So when I was young, again, a little old readout productions, I was really into race cars. I don't remember watching any race on television, mostly because three and four-year-old me did not have the intention span for that. What I do remember is owning a crap ton of Jimmy Johnson memorabilia. That was, I, I do remember Jimmy Johnson existing, and I think he is, what is he, tied with Richard Petty as one of the winningest NASCAR drivers of all time, though nobody will ever hold a candle to the king. I understand that. So I was big time Jimmy Johnson. I can't remember any races. I think I just like the pretty colors of the paint schemes, which, yeah, fair. They were very nicely painted back then. Uh, my cousin was, well, one of my cousins, the, the, only, the only one, my other one, really my age that we interact with on a regular basis. Uh, he was a big time Jeff Gordon fan. So Another cousin of ours went to an actual race and it had to have been like early 2000s because I just now noticed that the Winston Cup series, the logos emblazoned. So I think they, when they stopped doing the Winston Cup, what, around 2003, 2004? Because I guess Winston, he, they stopped sponsoring and now was it like the Sprint Cup or something? Oh, yeah, Sprint. That gets me. Oh, yeah, this is manling. Yeah, it is what it is. So they went to a race, got uh, purchase me this jacket, even though it's was at the time my rival's jacket. Uh, of course, they bought it when I was three years old. They're like, well, you know, it'll be something you grew into. And recently I've rediscovered that this jacket is in my collection. And I figured, well, why not? 
I'm thinking about NASCAR. Might as well wear it until I get too hot to wear it. So, yes, I am wearing a Jeff Gordon jacket from the Winston Cup series, but I'm not. I was not a historically a Jeff Gordon fan. So I threw in a little little poll in the chat just to have fun. I had to pick what four four choices. That's all the more the tube you gives me, which was who's the best NASCAR driver, Jimmy Johnson. I think I put Dale Earnhardt Sr. in there. Well, I have to, or else I'll be massacred by the internet. Uh, I put in Richard Petty, and then I put in, wait, why are we talking about NASCAR? And I think that's what Maji Chan responded with. Besides, it was Rusty Wallace. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But yeah, no, I remember watching, I remember it being on the background on television. I don't remember much, though, about the races themselves. I remember I had a crap ton of the match cars, though. I probably had like six or seven different variants of Johnson's car. If I get a few of Gordon's and I distinctly remember playing NASCAR 99 or was it NASCAR 2000 on the play, the original PlayStation, which my grandfather had. So yeah, I got, that was like my first video game I ever played as well was NASCAR. I, I want to say it was NASCAR 99, but it may have been 2000. It was the one that opened with George Farragut in the intro, which is just freaking awesome. And of course, I'm like, oh, what's NASCAR up to now? Wow, have they found a way to make racing really, really boring? Like, there's a playoff system now, and it's all about points and not about the winning the race itself, but rather what position you get in so you could qualify for a playoff. And apparently, there's been cases where people have had one of the worst winning seasons, like in terms of winning a race or finishing well, they can have one of the worst performances per track, yet somehow they can win the cup championship now. That don't make any freaking sense. So, yeah. I, I don't think I'm going to be becoming a NASCAR fan, a current one, anytime soon. Also, all the freaking paint schemes suck. They all look the same. There's some universal, you know, this universal logo craze where everybody's trying to oversimplify their logos. Yeah, that doesn't look cool on a car. <laughs> it looks crap. <laughs> like, like this, I miss the days, you know, that this, these, when DuPont was sponsoring Jeff Gordon and originally he had like the rainbow color scheme, but then he later on did the flame ones, which I think this actually has it on the back. That was a good paint scheme. Even just the simple black and white with the orange trim that Dale Earnhardt Sr. had. It's one of the most iconic paint schemes of all time. Everybody in there, the smoky, smoky, <laughs> but it's all gone. It's yeah, you know, it's it's all like almost anything we've enjoyed for years. It's all been diluted by corporate executives trying to decide, oh, well, this is going to if we over why is why do the corporate executives always over convolute things? They're like, I got to throw all these gimmicks in it and that's what it'll get. No, no, we want simplicity. The simpler something is, the more fun it is because the more easily accessible it is for the wider audience. This is why I'm probably the only Gen Zer that does not really care about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or at least in the sense of no, I was not. I'm probably one of the few that not not go and see Endgame in the theaters. At least I know that was like the big craze a few years back. I, I watched the MCU films, but I did it at a leisure pace. And I, the more they went on, and the more they like, it's all a one overarching show. I'm like, eh. Now you're making me do homework. <laughs> I am spending my money to get away from work. Why am I spending? Why is me? Why is my leisure becoming more stressful than my actual work em environment or my college environment? That That's not how it's supposed to work. It's about pleasing the sponsors. Well, at least the sponsors used to be cooler back in the day. I mean, all of these are, I think, far superior sponsors than what I see on the low. Yeah. I mean, some of the sponsors like I, Jimmy Johnson apparently still racing. He does like a limit. He has like a limited number of races he does, which I might still just for the heck of it watch. If he, I think he has like eight races he signed up for this year, just for old time's sake, watch it. But now he's with like Carvana. I, I get actually to be fair, that's one of the more automotive relatable sponsors. I'll give him that, but also Carvana, really, yeah, it is what it is.
Times have changed, not for the greater. Now, before we do the part of this NASCAR rant that I've gone into, I, I do want to mention uh, something I did this week, which I never thought I would do, is watch the movie Days of Thunder. Because for years I've heard of Days of Thunder. I've heard that it's the movie that killed the 1980s action genre. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard there was a lot of debauchery behind the scenes and the cost was so enormous that no matter what it made in the box office, they wouldn't be able to make up their deficit. Gee, that would never happen again in the history of cinema. No, no, no. Uh, movie executives indulging in debauchery and the cost of production skyrocketing to the, beyond the point of profitability. That That's a thing of the past, guys. I promise you. Hi, Lily. My cat is showing up. This isn't the curious one, the gray one you see. This is the evil one. I'm a little scared right now. The evil one, and especially because I'm wearing a very a, a jacket that I I prize and respect. You're gonna come up here and completely destroy it, aren't you? Okay, let's let's. Well, it's not my fault that you got stuck to the side of my chair. I think we need to get them claws looked at. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Okay, my cat's probably going to jump up here any moment, and it's going to cause me to re-intensively. I apologize about that if that happens later in the stream. Trailer and RV races. Hey, that is some redneck crap. I'm allowed to say that because I live in the mountains. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying I want to go see that. <laughs> that, is, that sounds like something somebody would do down the street up here. <laughs> and I'd be all for it. There is actually a local racetrack nearby it's not nothing major it was a dirt track for many years they recently paved it uh one of my neighbors their son-in-law actually races for that track occasionally so i probably should one day go up and watch them spin around spin the tires so days of thunder for years i heard it was the movie that killed the 80s action genre due to excessive fun funds well, recently it's been resurfacing on the internet. It's become quite a bit of a cult classic. And I decided to watch it the other night. It was pretty decent. I had fun with it. There's stuff I liked. There's stuff I don't like. I love the action sequences. I am, it was, I think it was, I'm presuming it was Tony Scott that directed that. I, I probably should know that because I, I watched the movie last night. And, you know, his name probably appeared on the cre credits. Yeah, Tony Scott directed it, and he got a keen eye for action sequences, most famous for Top Gun. And many people said that Days of Thunder was Tony Scott's attempt to replicate Top Gun. I mean, he brought freaking Tom Cruise back in the leading role as a hot, you know, hotshot rookie who got to be taught a few lessons. I will say it's not as much as it's billed as, oh, it's just like Top Gun. No, it's it's it has its own different charm. I will say. The character name of Cole Trickle got to be one of the stupidest names I've ever heard of all the fates. Like, yeah, Cole Trickle. Man, all the kids are going to want to be like Cole Trickle. Ugh, that's just, I don't know, that 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 name just sounds gross. I don't know why. Of all the names you could have chosen. But I, I find actually Tom Cruise did pretty good in the movie. It was pretty charming. Uh, I also enjoyed that it helps that he was surrounded by a bunch of actors that I actually enjoy because I'm not a big Tom Cruise fan. But, you know, you put him against Robert Duvall. Uh, you throw John C. Riley in there. Does John C. Riley have a thing for NASCAR movies? <laughs> he, he, was in, he was in Talladega Nights as well. The Ricky Bobby story. Uh weird uh randy quaid is in there as basically he's the businessman that kind of funds the whole project together the he kind of convinces duvall to come out of retirement to build a race car for a hotshot rookie that's played by cruz and then when cruz has a wreck well the the used car salesman does what the used car salesman does and just basically calls the broken up hot shot oh you're you're washed up already i got this new car race car driver gary elways he's he's better now and i'm gonna try to operate with two racers on the same team i don't see anything going wrong here man it was just cool to see in the cars from 1990 i th that those were true stock cars even though that was in the phase where everything was starting to be specially designed they still retain their stock car image where today they they look they're almost shapeless 
I, and I get why that is. I get the safety improvements. I'm not saying that those shouldn't be there, but. Again, ugly paint schemes. They were much cooler in the movie and much cooler back in the back in the day. So I enjoyed all the racing sequences. All that stuff was great. And all the interactions between Cruz and Duvall. I can watch Robert Duvall all day. He, he, he can monologue all day. I'll be happy. The pro I, I think there was a I, he is named after an actual NASCAR driver, but I don't know why. Dick Trick. Dick Trick. Oh, oh, that. I don't like that name anyways. Uh, so, the stuff I didn't like was the stuff with Nicole Kidman. That 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 came right out. Top Gun. Ooh, here is the love interest that, you know, is technically supposed to be a professional that Cruz has to respect, but they fall in love. That that was ripped right from Top Gun. I, I, I actually skimmed over almost of Nicole Kidman sequences. I'm like, okay, let's get back to the racing. Let's get back to the action. So I actually enjoyed Days of Thunder. It was fun. And, and nothing... Nothing groundbreaking, but it was fun to have popcorn and a non-water beverage. We'll just put it that way. Now, the reason I'm talking about all this on Uncut History, this actually ties in with preserving history. The reason Days of Thunder is in the tube algorithm lately is because of the relatively recent discovery of screen-used cars and are being found out in the bushwork of the mid Atlantic region. At least I think it's the mid Atlantic region or find them. I want to say it was North Carolina. Uh, so there's been several videos and articles about them. I'm not, we're not gonna talk too much about them, but uh, days with Jordan, the lion, great uh, travel vlog series. If you've not yet followed his stuff, I do recommend. Uh, he did a video just a few days back. Well, first he actually went to the barn that was used to film the sequences, which is where Duvall's character actually builds Trickle's car. But then he started getting contacts about, you know that some of these screen used cars are being located. And three of the cars are currently at an auto shop. So what we're going to do, I'm actually going to, I'm going to do this. We're going to play a little bit of his video. Why not? Why not? But to do that, I got to make it a link. I can't. I, StreamYards, why can't we share audio on a window? Why do I have to do it in individual files? It's so freaking annoying. Oh, where am I at? Oh, that's weird. Yeah, so this is from Days of Jordan the Lion. Let's take a peek. With Please. Wow, the two cars. I Wow. I'm, I'm kind of in shock here. We have the Carrie Elway's Russ Wheeler car. Remember, they were Hardy's dug car, out of the woods, which, guys. You know, I, I was watching the movie the other day, and I'm sitting here going, they couldn't have found anybody better to play that part, <laughs> that smug look on his face. It really explains how Carrie Elway's end up playing, um, uh, again, his role in Twister. <laughs> <laughs> and then... If you've watched Twister, if you know how he is in Twister, that's just Carrie Elway's in Days of Thunder. This, this is the 51, this is the car that, uh, that I thought I was looking at when we made the Days of Thunder video, but I think. There I actually can see the autograph for the fictitious character of Cole Trickle. God, I, I think we're sure that this is what I was really looking for. And the guy that invited me out here to see it is going to tell us his story. So let's meet Joe. Hey, everybody. How's it going? So tell me your story. You know, how did you get involved? I also really want that Coors Banquet banner that's in the background. Uh, Pontiac Auto Body. I, I'd be, if you can find me a second one, I'd be happy to. Uh, we'll put it not on this stream. We'll put on our cars. Stream. And um, what are what are we looking at here? So. I mean, my involvement with these things goes back to when I was, you know, a little tiny kid. I used to watch these things with my parents on TV in the early 80s and stuff. And I was always a huge Winston Cup NASCAR fan. And I remember when the movie came out, I was about 10 years old. And I was, you know, I grew up in South Florida. Now, here's what I'm going to say. We're not going to watch it much more. I am going to drop the link. I do recommend after tonight's stream. Uh, this gentleman has a fast, very cool story about how he fell in love with the movie, how he was able to get the contacts. Getting the uh, Cole Trickle hero car was a very difficult fight for him to get. And his end goal is he's not going to restore the cars. And the reason is 
that would kind of, if to restore them to any type of ideal appearance, you would have to replace everything on the vehicle. So it would not be the original car anymore. Sadly, for 30 years has worn it to the point that this is, if you want to have the original cars, you have to display it barn fresh. So right now, I think he's just playing to hold it. He actually took the down, he took the cars down to Daytona back in February to have them on display. At least that's what he was talking about in the video. Had a good response from the general public seeing it. And it sounds like he may be doing that more often, taking this on tour to the NASCAR store. Uh, NASCAR racetracks throughout the season just to have the public get a chance to photograph with the car you the, the car used movies. What's a car used movie? Hmm. Answer that in the chat. So if you want to watch the full video from Days with Our Lion, Days with Jordan the Lion, be sure to check the link down below. All right. 20 minutes in. I think I've lost everybody. You're like, well, what is this man doing? He, I, he came here to hear about a very important preservation story. Well, we are. We're going to talk about a very important preservation story. And that is what's happening in Prince Will. Ugh, my brain just had a brain fart. That's what's happening down in Virginia. I, mean, I do have notes. I did have notes. You know, I try to organize my office if you want to call it that and then you know they just disappear it doesn't help when you have some cats you know we have the one that always tries to loves plastic that's that's the gray one is the gray one back there no the evil one's back there ah here we are just want to get prepared by the way guys i will have the notes for this show up tomorrow for our garrison members i didn't have time to transfer them from paper over to text on the internet so i have to do that tomorrow so i apologize about the delay i know you guys haven't been getting a lot of scripts the past few weeks just because i've been recording a lot so a lot of recording next few months we're doing a lot of editing so you'll probably be starting to get more scripts for those that are members of the garrison and if you do want to become part of the garrison our membership program our link is in the description below but yes this is coming out of prince william county in Virginia, which by the way is the second most populous county in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And the situation is that the world's largest data center appears to be established going to be established to the adjacent border of the Manassas National Battlefield. Now, if you're not familiar what the historical value of Manassas Battlefield is, Wind the clocks back to 1861, and this is where the first major land battle, the American Civil War, ensued. This is the famed engagement where we get the moniker of Stonewall Jackson from. Uh, Thomas Jackson's brigade were on Henry House Hill. The morning of the battle looked like it was going to be a Union victory, an easy one. They were able to outflank the Confederate line along Bull Run. They came across uh, Matthews Hill it, down the valley and were ascending Henry House Hill. Looked like they're going to march right into Richmond and the American Civil War was going to be over in one big spectacular battle. And then famously Stonewall Jackson stood with his four regiments on top of Henry House Hill. Uh, the moniker of Stonewall is still disputed if it was meant to rally the rest of the army around Jackson, or it was a general basically going, oh, look at Jackson. He's a dim way. He's just standing there deaf in the face, like a stone wall to the whole Confederate cause of blowing around us. Historically, we all know what follows. Uh, the Confederates were able to mount a counterattack. Uh, they break the morale of the Union army and the Union army goes running back to Washington, D.C., intermixed in with all the picnic goers that had come out to view the battle that morning because they thought, oh, it's so charming. Our country is imploding around us. Let's sip our tea and have our sandwiches. Honestly, that's just Twitter in a nutshell today. <laughs> oh, the world's imploding. Let's spam with memes. <laughs> this is fine. But this was not the only engagement that occurred on this battlefield. An equally important battle of similar troop size occurred just a year later, and that was the Battle of Second Manassas. In this situation, uh, General George B. McClellan of the Army of the Potomac had kind of been put in the dog pen by President Lincoln after his failure to capture Richmond through the Virginia Peninsula. And instead, the Army of Virginia, commanded by John Pope, was sent out with some detachments from the Army of the Potomac. And this was Pope's big chance to impress the 
uh, the elite of Washington, D.C., and maybe even replace McClellan officially as commander-in-chief. It went horribly. <laughs> and once again, Stonewall Jackson was there, but instead of being on the south side, he was on the north side of the battlefield, and he used his men used a railroad cut. And when their ammunition ran out, I kid you not, Jackson's men began throwing rocks from the railroad cut at the Union soldiers. There was a literal rock fight in a major American Civil War battle that decided the outcome as a Confederate victory. And once more, the Union Army ran back to Washington, D.C., and we never heard from John Pope ever again. So these two major battles occurred on the same piece of ground, which is just very interesting to think of in itself. And it is, of course, part of the National Park Service today. The problem is Manassas Junction historically was a very important artery for the United States of America. That's why all these battles were fought on this land, because nearby was an important railroad junction and commerce always came through what we know as Prince William County. That's still the case today. And since it's a very, it's a, the county predominantly serves as a suburb to Washington, D.C. It's only about, what, a half hour, 45 minute drive from that, from the city, from the capital. It is one of the most heavily built up parts of the country. I mean, you can look at a Google map and you're just going to see urban sprawl, especially on the southeast side of the county. Uh, there are efforts to stop this. There is a for, uh, national forest that preserves part of the county. There's the battlefield itself, but it's not enough. It keeps getting built up over and over. So it's a constant battle. Prince William County is a constant battleground between preservationists, both in the historical sense and in the environmental sense versus uh, um, expansion and progress, you want to say. And this, no, this isn't something new that the Manassas National Battlefield has been under threat of a massive project being built adjacent to it uh, back in the 1950s. And this is kind of what propelled the, I think this is what actually propelled the creation of the Manassas National Battlefield instead of just being a small park that, no, this is going to have federal protection. Uh, the situation was that a major interstate was going to be built right through the heart of where the battlefield occurred, right between Matthews Hill and Henry House Hill. That interstate is 10 lanes wide kind of destroy the historical integrity of the property. Uh, but there was enough pushback that they realigned the interstate, and now it's the southern boundary of the National Park site. And there is still a very busy road to, I think it's a busy four-lane road. It goes through the middle. There's red lights in the middle of the park, but it's nothing compared to the 10-lane road it may have been. Then there have been multiple efforts to try to build an amusement park adjacent to the battlefield because of its historical prominence. Let's bank on it, says the funny mouse coming up from Florida. Yes, I am talking about Walt Disney Studios, though they were not the first ones to try to build an amusement park. They just were merely the most famous attempt made. That was actually in the 1990s. To be fair, their plans for America land, which would have had a replica, a recreation of the battle of the USS Monitor in CSS Virginia. I'd have been down for it. Just, just not near a major battlefield where you have the potential of destroying the hysterical integrity of the property. And now you're probably saying, well, it sounds like all these projects are adjacent, not in the park. So what's the big fuss? The big fuss is what a, Park preserves is only a fragment of the historical sphere, if you will. And this isn't just about Manassas. This is all historic sites. If you're dealing with sites of military history, you have your focal point where all the famous stuff occurred. But then you got the background stuff where all the artillery trains would have been parked, where the supply wagons are parked, where the hospitals are located, sometimes where the command posts are located. And that can keep that can go for several miles in any direction. And when you're trying to educate guests at a historic site, particularly in this example, a battlefield, and you're trying to explain how the troops are moving in and moving out and why they're making decisions, why the commanders are deciding this. It's a little awkward when just over the tree line, there's a giant skyscraper. And I kid you not, you will have people. They will not be able to use their imagination to erase that. I was on a tour once in Gettysburg and somebody asked, well, how was Jenny Wade, the only civilian casualty of that battle, killed? 
and the tour guide's like, well, the bullet came from one of these structures along the south side of town and went across and there was nothing here. But that would mean, I kid you not, this was said, that would mean the bullet would have to pause, make a right turn, make a left turn around the hotel, make a right turn and make another right turn. People are stupid sometimes. <laughs> so it is important, especially if you're in the field of historical interpretation, you're trying to teach about historical events on the actual property. Not only that the ground itself that the event occurred on is preserved, but its surroundings are kept in enough of a state where there's nothing to distract from the, his, the historical storytelling, if that makes sense. So President... Build up around a battlefield itself is not necessarily the end of the world, but it's when you're completely eviscerating the skyline, when you're bringing in all these non-appropriate noises and you're polluting the atmosphere, all this kind of it does not, it kind of, it it kind of it takes away from the actual historical preservation efforts on the property itself. So it's not just about preserving the land where the event occurred on. It's also about preserving the full arena of history, if that makes sense. The ground, the sky, the skyline, all that to create the best learning environment. So uh, this is, I think for at least a year now, this has been happening at the Manassas National Battlefield. There is an entity looking to put in a data center. Data, data, I've said both tonight. The data center is designed to basically house all of these CPUs, all of these servers, these network platforms to host websites, to host all sorts of inner online communications. And data centers are required in terms of being able to communicate, like how I'm communicating with you right now. You know, this is all this information is being relayed by my server down, well, by my router downstairs, being sent over to the internet. It's going through some server, server somewhere in the country, wherever the two view servers are. That's how all that works. And the bigger your website is, the more storage you need to have. I, I understand that completely. So data centers, you we're gonna need them in our in the future day and age. And if we can keep them domestic here in the United States, I'd be very, I'd feel very, very happy about that. I don't necessarily feel like my information going overseas to a country that is very non-friendly with my own. I'm sure the people on the other side of the world can probably relate the same way. I don't think if somebody's an enemy of the United States, they want their information being relayed for us. Just saying. But this particular center is going to be the largest in the world. That's right. The United States may very well have the largest data center in the world. The problem, it's going to be right on the western boundary of the Manassas National Battlefield. And it is going to take over almost three miles of Park, uh, of Park Page Lane. At least I think that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah, I'm very professional. Look at me. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'd love to get the chance to go down and visit Manassas. And we have been talking. Talks have been said behind the scenes here. Pageland Lane, my apologies. About three miles of Pageland Lane is set to be developed into the world's largest data center. What that's going to mean is, if you are standing on Henry House Hill, where General Jackson stood 160 years ago, you're going to see a highway in the middle of the dip. You're going to see the nice historic glasslands. You're going to see a, tree, a, sm a thin tree line. And then you're going to see nothing but gray blocks, about 32 buildings that are part of this data center, which are going to have all sorts of air conditioning units going full blast. You're going to have this very, very non-appropriate hum over the sound of car horns going burp. Yeah, that's not really going to help with the historical interpretation of what happened on the grounds. So because of this, the uh, residents around Gainesville, Virginia, which is a nearby town to the battlefield, have been fighting against it. Not just because of the the process, not just because the status center will destroy the historical in integrity of Manassas, but also because it's going to destroy the landscape. They're going to carve up three miles of landscape here to put this data center in. It's going to bring pollution to the area, which is already pretty decently polluted, considering all the heavy traffic that's coming through there. You know, this isn't really improving the pro. You're not really improving the problem. We're just kind of making it worse. And a lot of people are like, this isn't the business we want. We want to keep our countryside. There isn't much of it here in Prince Williams County. Can we, just because it's not in the battlefield boundaries, can't we have this, you know, nice 
farm field still? Why are we getting, why is this getting rid of? You're going to destroy the ecosystem here. Who knows? Irreversible damage. I can be done by putting this data center in. I know I'm going back and forth between data and data. I can't help it. I'm I'm rolling. I am rolling. But I do have to pause to mention that Wrangler drops in a 420. Thank you, Wrangler. And we also have Fu Man Blue joining in for $5. Thank you very much. Hail the host, hail the chat, and hail the Iron Age. That is right, the Iron Age of pop culture, creating a variety of media that's decentralized, that is not controlled by the mainstream media outlets. They, This is all made by fans for fans. And that $5 does give you a... Money! Got to play that twice. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> now, Wrangler, you can't thumb up your own. That's not fair. That's what we call. That's what we call fortifying. We call that fortifying your super chat. So, back to the data center that's going at Manassas National Battlefield. So, yeah, it's going to destroy the historical surroundings of the battlefield. It'll make it difficult to interpret it to the general public. It's also going to destroy the environment in Prince William County just in general. And Prince William County is already heavily populated. This is only going to make matters worse. So... Citizens have been pushing back against Prince William County, have been speaking out against it. And in December 2023, there was a meeting of the supervisors of the county, and they voted to approve the project, which outraged many residents of Gainesville, Virginia, who filed a lawsuit against the county. And it isn't just the residents. They are, they are teaming up with the American Battlefield Trust, a non-for-profit to strive to preserve uh, military historical sites in the United States of America, especially relating to the American Civil War, the Revolution, and the War of 1812. So we're getting a little bit bigger guns involved. This isn't just residents fighting the county government. Now we got one of the mass, one of the larger non-for-profits in the country backing them. And there's a variety of different charges. They're, uh, they're suing the county over. But the key one is, and this is the interesting one, that the Prince William County had violated uh, Virginia law in hosting the meeting. Now, you may be asking, how so? Well, according to Virginia law, or at least how the American Battlefield Trust is interpreting it, there has, if you're going to have a meeting relating to zoning, there has to have two consecutive weeks of notice in the newspaper. It has to be printed for two straight weeks if you're going to have a meeting relating to zoning. The argument being made by the plaintiff is that the defendant did not give proper notice to printed uh, printed media to let the public know that this meeting was happening, which means defend essentially that the county officials fast-tracked this project. And why would they fast-track it? Oh, because it turns out that some of those that were in power, uh, the incumbents had lost elections and were on their way out before the year was over. At least that's what the article I was reading was about. So that's the political motivation behind it. And if you want to get into the petty party politics, for those that want to know, uh, it, it is said that the Democratic members of Prince William County were in favor of the data center. The Republican members of Prince William County, they opposed it. And they actually, it's, that's at least what the article I was reading about said, that the Republican members were petitioning the rest of the supervisors to postpone the meeting until enough time was given out to notify the residents of the county that this zoning meeting was happening. So that is the key argument that's happening in this lawsuit. They, that uh, the plaintiff, which is the American Battlefield Trust and concerned residents of Gainesville, Virginia, are saying that the supervisors of Prince William County violated a state law that they did not give proper printed notice that the zoning meeting was happening. Therefore, they were not able to have their voices properly heard. I don't want to speak any much more on the legality of the situation. I am not a lawyer. I do not act like I am one. This is just the facts that I'm gathering together and we'll see where it lies in the courts. Yep, that's what we're getting into right now. Mer yep, American Battlefield Trust. American, I was about to say American Battle Tribe. American Battlefield Trust have filed a lawsuit to try to stop this nonsense, is what the ghost of how its right arm says. And Fu Memelu says shady business. And indeed, it is pretty interesting how it looks like it, this could have been fast tracked. 
We'll see what the courts decide. We'll see where this is going to go. But I'm more interested in this because this is because this is such a common problem in historical preservation, where people have a misunderstanding what it means. Oh, it means we preserve this piece of grass and put a sign up, and that's it. That's historical preservation. We're recognizing this event occurred. Yeah, you could do that. But it's preferable if you can get more immersive with the education, because when you become more immersive, that's how you get people to learn. Because simply listing off a bunch of dates and names and numbers really ain't going to get people's interest. If you are able to connect to their five senses, the public's going to be more invested in learning about a historical event, and they're going to remember the lessons that were from these historical events. We talked about this last week when we talked about the dilemma that's happening in Old Ben's Fort, and we're going to keep talking about it right now. There was a similar situation about urban sprawl engulfing part of a part of a battlefield's periphery in New Jersey, and that was at the Monmouth Battlefield State Park. Now we have talked about the Battle of Monmouth actually in detail here on Readout Productions. Now we've yet to actually visit there in person. I'm hoping to do that one day. It's one of the it's one of my favorite battles of the revolution. I use quotes because I don't want to say I love this battle. I love people shooting. That's not what I mean. I don't mean I love people getting killed, but I do have a I'm very interested in the Battle of Monmouth. On the count, it's the first major action the Continental Army sees after they leave the Valley Forge encampment. And it's up to debate if it proved that von Steuben's training had worked or nothing had changed. It's still up to debate this very day. I feel that his training had worked. I'm, I'm a big Von Steuben guy. So, you know, I, I think the Battle of Monmouth fully shows that the drills that were conducted at Valley Ford went on to improve that army and led to the winning of the revolution. Uh, we've done a whole documentary through Construction Paper Battlefield on, on the channel. If you have a chance later on tonight or in the future, consider checking it out. Unfortunately, this very important site is not well preserved. And that's not to say anything against the staff and the volunteers of the Monmouth battlefield. They are fully devoted to their history. When I watch any videos of their tours, I can tell that they are passionate about the site, but it is one of those sites where the funding is just not there. This is just like how we talk about old Ben's Fort having to face the dilemma of how are we going to keep doing our interpretive programs when the funding's limited this is the same happening. And we're now dealing with the state level. So we're, we're dealing with less funding now than the federal level does. And the battlefield itself is preserved in patchwork. There's areas that are preserved and there's areas that are overgrown that the park doesn't really have, or they do own and they just don't have the resources to maintain it the way they would like to. There are also parts of the larger battlefield that just aren't preserved by the state park. And those are what's under danger. And, well, just south of where the state park's boundaries are, a battle of preservation has just been lost as the local, I want to say the local county or the local township approved a massive warehouse being built on it. The argument was made that the historical maps do not show any major fighting occur on that portion of the battlefield. Therefore, it's not deemed... Uh, need, needed of historical preservation. But as I mentioned with my example of Manassas Battlefield and of any battlefield in military history, you have your focal point where the key events occur. You then have your second line where, you know, you have your guys held in reserve. You got your, you got your command posts. Then you got your supply wagons, your artillery parks, and then you got your field hospitals all the way out. A battlefield is massive. It's not just the two lines shooting at each other. It's a massive piece of ground, especially when it gets these bigger engagements, which Monmouth is a massive engagement. It's the last major battle in the Northern feeder of the American revolution fought in June of 1778. Uh, the, State uh, members of the state park, friends groups, they pushed back against this plan to develop a warehouse. The news came out recently today had lost this plan. Now I think there are a few can, there are a few caveats put into the approval. I think they have, I'm not certain, but I think they have to do archaeology. Don't quote me. I wanted to have the article up. I was talking. Well, I went, tried to back and access it. It's given me a paywall now. Not very happy about that. So I, I'm kind of going off, off what I saw in my brain, but I do know that this preservation battle was lost uh, adjacent to the Monmouth State Park. So in about a year's time, there's going to be a massive warehouse that's going to obstruct the skyline where, 
uh, 250 years ago, George Washington and the American soldiers fought Henry Clinton and the British Army. It's going to be a little awkward. So this is happening all over the place. It's important to not just to preserve the historic ground itself, but keep the skyline relatively intact. So I, I, I'm a reasonable guy. We wiggle room can be always be made. We we want our country, we want our state, we want our counties, we want our townships to improve economically. Is there something that can economically improve them? Absolutely. If it if it has to be adjacent to a property, a historical property, then let's let's find a way to make it fit in. Let's not just slap it in and destroy the landscape. Let's work to find a way to make it fit in. Is there a historic structure that maybe is vacant? Hey, why don't you guys fill that up? You know, we can, you know, let's put a business in there, you know, try to preserve the integrity of the building, but let's repurpose it. Not this, we're raising everything, miles and miles of sprawl. We don't, no, no, there's the, the park over here tells you about what happened where we're standing on it. So it's, it's a daily struggle in historical preservation. It's not just about preserving the historic property itself, but its surroundings as well. The, you got to have the whole, you have to have the full picture to understand what happened there in the time period. So we'll see what happens here with the crisis that's happening at Manassas National Battlefield. And something interesting I heard about, I just want to mention this. Apparently, because there's different terms you'll notice for these federal military sites. Gettysburg, for example, is Gettysburg National Military Park. That's how it's been labeled. Then you have Manassas National Battlefield or Antietam National Battlefield. And sometimes you'll have memorials and sometimes you'll have landmarks. Well, why, why aren't they all just parks? Well, I'll explain a little bit about it. Back in the days, or I'm talking ye old times, when these park systems were established, when you would have a park, it meant that they were going in, the federal government was buying all the property. Everything was going to be preserved. Like Yellowstone, Yosemite, those are national parks. They own everything. But when we get into the military history, of course, the government's trying to be frugal and I want to... The government doesn't want to spend a bunch of money on a historical preservation project. That's the truth of it. <laughs> They 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 are very, they are very very limited when it comes to spending money to preserve something. Now, if it's the other way around, oh, spending money to acquire something. Oh, okay. Oh, build this, build that. Oh, we just have all this money everywhere. Oh, you need to preserve that. Oh, well, you're gonna have to fill out this checklist, and it's gonna be a hundred pages long, and you got to make sure you meet all of these requirements exactly. And we may give you a fifth of what we're offering. So yeah, trying to get money for the government for preservation is a pain. And every museum goes through it applying for grants and other things from the government to keep them function so they're able to function. So I'm not even talking about actual national park sites. I'm not even talking about private non-for-profits. They appeal for federal grant money or state grant money because it's in many ways the only way they would be able to have some type of income to preserve the sites. But back on track what I'm saying. Battlefields, the national park like designation for battlefield, originally just meant they were going to mark the right of way to tour the properties. The properties themselves were not going to be preserved by the federal government. The federal government maintained the roadways and infrastructure, which is usually where the monuments were located, all that, but they didn't go out and actually buy the fields and the fences and the historic structures. And the reason they didn't do that for many years was because their, their argument was, well, it's farm field. It ain't going to change too much. Well, until after the Second World War happened and urban sprawl went to new levels. And that's where places like Antietam and Manassas, they had to change what they were doing. Instead of being just marked roadways on how to tour these properties, that's when they started actually buying up land. So that's why you have all these sites. Some of them are called battlefields. The reason is because when they started out, they really were just about marking the passageways rather than preserving all the land. So preserving all the land, regardless of park site, is more of a recent undertaking by the National Park Service. They tried to be li they were they tried for many years to be limited on when they came in and actually acquired land. So that that's just something I've heard in the past that I think it's pretty interesting why these, at least when it comes to military history sites in the United States, why some are military parks, why some are battlefields. 
Memorials are usually can be really any location. It usually is a location. It has a tie to an individual or to an event. It does not necessarily have to be the most important tie, but it may be the only tie. Uh, for instance, there is a, there is, I think it was, a, is it Thaddeus Kozitsko? Kozitsko? Uh, it was a, how do you pronounce his name? Uh, it was a foreign volunteer for the American, for the Connell Army. Thaddeus Kozitsko. Thaddeus Koz Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko. He was a Polish-Lithuanian engineer that came in and assisted the Connell Army during the American Revolution, helped design a variety of defenses for the Connell Army. Anyways, there is a national park dedicated to him. It's it, it's the smallest, I think it is the smallest park unit in the country. If not, it's one of the, it, it's an apartment building that he rented for a few months when he stayed in Philadelphia. It, and they don't even know what room he stayed in, but unfortunately there's very little material goods relating to him, to this Fadius Kazisco. So in a way to honor Kazisco's contributions to the United States of America, the Park Service purchased property for this little building. And now it is known as the Fadius Kazisco National Memorial, one of, if not the smallest national park units, which you can visit in Philadelphia. Again, if I ever go to Philadelphia, maybe so. I'd love to visit it just because I'm into that quirkiness. So Memorial, when it comes to the National Park labeling system, it doesn't have to be the actual place where the event occurred. Merely, it's like we have a tie to this individual. Uh, the Johnstown Flood National Memorial is actually a bit of a better memorial ran by the National Park Service because it's preserving the lake bed that caused the Johnstown flood of 1889. So it is actually a direct tie. It's it's a much big, bigger driving force. But you'll see a lot of these national memorials set up. Some of them are simply just monuments operated by the National Park Service. So yeah, that the, the distinction is really interesting. You know, I could just make a stream just talking about the different designations the National Park Service uses and kind of how it historically equates to how they were operated in the past. Maybe an idea for a future stream. I'd love to talk more about this. But but we actually got a few more on the plate. But first, I need water. Yeah, I needed that water. Oh, no. I've opened up the 2024 news tab. Oh God, what's happening? Putin is now openly planning for war with NATO, which I think they've been saying for years. Solar eclipse warning issued for millions of drivers. Doesn't sue saying a Zempic other weight loss and diabetes drugs can cause harmful. Two new ground armies and ominous warning to the West. State's largest police union makes major endorsement in the upcoming election. Something about Trump, something about NATO. Something else about Trump. Something else about Putin. The world is ending. There's no way to stop it. We're all going There's to... There's always an alien battle cruiser or a Karelian death ray or an intergalactic plague that's about to wipe out life on this miserable little planet. The only way these people get on with their happy lives is they do not know about it. Does that mean have a denuralizer on them by any chance? Drinking fresh, drink water, fish food. Yeah, the, the, that's one way to look at it. Mm. Yeah, I bet you're a great tactician. I am terrible. <laughs> I hope you're playing the play, Garrett's team. Oh, so you're referring to Captain Garrett, who is actually planning. He's in the working progress of an RPG for Fallout. Sadly, I won't be able to join the one he's planning currently. I am very occupied at the moment. I've also I've gone a few invites to do some tabletop RPGs lately. I don't have the time to spring, sadly. But hopefully later in the summer. I, I've talked about it a few times on our streams. We're we're hoping in the end of this year, you know, bar and the nukes haven't dropped. That that 
we're me and a humble collector and a few others are going to get together and we're going to do a tabletop game relating to the second world war. So, and he's, he's working on all that. I hope he's documenting his process because I've gone to see glimpses of him building his table. And now he's working on painting the figures. I hope he's documenting the process because what we're hoping to achieve with that is like a little wars TV level of war gaming. So fortunately I won't be able to do any tabletop games this spring, but Hopefully I'll get to do later this summer one one time when I'm not in the collage. I'm not doing what I am not fighting the American academic system, academic system, uh, fun times. So what else do I got? Well, I don't have much of my brain, so I can't do use anything for my brain. Hey, but you know, what's pretty cool. Speaking of a preservation effort. I forgot all about this until I was getting ready to go on. So I saw this last minute. The USS New Jersey, the Thane battleship, is on its way to dry dock for maintenance. And this comes from the Associated Press. The Thane battleship floated down the Delaware River this Thursday for it, after it's left its dock in Camden, New Jersey, on its way to the Philadelphia Navy Yard for extensive maintenance. The vessel, guided by tugboats, was first headed to the Paulsboro Marine Terminal, where it'll be balanced to prepare for dry docking and will then go to the Navy Yard in six days. Major work is expected to take two months to complete. Officials are saying three major repairs needed included in repainting the hull, fixing anti-corrosion systems underneath the ship, and inspecting through hull openings. The battleship, which was built in the 1940s, served for about 50 years before its retirement in February of 1991. It has been a floating museum ever since. The ship was built at the former Philadelphia Naval Shipyard and launched there on December 2nd, 1941, commemorating the first anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The ship is the most decorated battleship in naval history, earning distinction with World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, Cold War, and conflicts in the Middle East, according to its webpage. The ship steamed more miles, fought in more battles, and fired more shells than any other battleship. Thursday's ceremony was attended by veterans who served aboard the ship, including Captain Walter M. Urban Jr., who was the public affairs officer from 1970 for 2000, serving with the, both the Army and Navy Reserves. He worked aboard the battleship between 1985 and 1991. So, yeah, it's getting a major overhaul to make sure that it's, it's watertight and it can be preserved for future generations. So, Time. Um, so the, she was a symbol of our great country at oh, that time. They, and of course, the oh, Iowa class battle, audio issue, which New Jersey is part of, were considered to be the iconic symbols of naval over. sea power back in the day. So to be part of that history and to see her uh, today, you know, 81 years later, it's, it's fascinating. And I'm just so delighted and honored to be part of that experience. How many people want to bet that there's some Pittsburgh steel in that ship? I'd like to bet. I like the claim that, you know, Pittsburgh provided copious amounts of steel and quite literally built our nation's infrastructure and our and our country's warships, our country's weapons. Just, just, just want to front it out there for Pittsburgh, you know. This is an incredibly uh, powerful day for this state and for this community. Uh, you think about World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War, Lebanon. You all know this as well as I do. There's no... Yeah, it's crazy to think that we actually had battleships in service in our early interventions in the Middle East. And then we stopped using them. I know they're obsolete, but they're freaking cool. <laughs> you know, sometimes the coolness value is worthwhile on the battlefield. Just, just saying. But I, alas, I know the day of the battleship is long dead. The Japanese killed it. And then we excelled at the art of the aircraft carrier. It was weird how that worked. So yeah, USS New Jersey is in dry dock currently, expected to take about two months before it'll be returned, and this will allow it to be preserved for many more generations to come. Man, I really got to do more naval stuff here on Redout Productions. I really want to go see more battleships, but, you know, Pittsburgh really... We, we don't have battleships on our rivers. Funny story, you know, battleships don't do well on only rivers that are about nine foot deep. That, that don't work. But they did build a lot of LSTs in Pittsburgh. But the only LST that still survived, and things all the way, what, in Indiana? I could go. There's a lot of things I want to do. <laughs> a lot of things I want to do. All right. Well, we got to 
few more things go. Oh, and before we completely wrap up tonight, I got a drop in the link in the description below. I completely forgot. If you want to watch more relating to uh, the American Battlefield Trust fighting against the uh, Prince William County of Virginia in court over a data center being built on Manas near the Manassas National Battlefield. Those are links right now in the chat if you want to go and explore, watch their perspective of this developing situation. All right, I did that. Do we, do we talk about... Okay, we've hit the hour mark, so we're entering the goofy portion of the show. <laughs> yeah, the goofy portion starts now. Because an hour in is when I start getting loopy. I don't know why. I, and I'm not drinking anything other than the water. Or as the ghost of Howard's right arm puts it, uh, the water that the fish did stuff in. Wow, that felt weird. So, I guess we'll talk about it. 20th Century Fox, which is owned by the funny mouse that currently lives in Florida, released a trailer for Alien Romulus. Why am I talking about this on Redout Productions? Because this is my channel and the Alien franchise is something I adore. So this is the trailer. We're going to complete... We're going to just leave... The, we're going to leave the audio off just so I don't get copyright striked. So, the last time we saw an alien film was what? Seven, eight years ago? 17, 8, 9, 20. Yeah, seven years ago. It was Alien Covenant, the second part of Ridley Scott's prequel trilogy explaining the lore of the Xenomorph. Or so we thought it actually turned into a very pretentious riff about how he really, 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 really wanted to do more Blade Runner movies, but instead he decided to put it inside the alien universe. Which, yeah, wait, aren't they the same? Didn't he say that they're like the same universe now? Okay, fine. Why? Why does everything got to be a cinematic universe? Stop giving me homework. Yeah, so I'm not a fan of Scott, what Ridley Scott's done with the Alien franchise. I understand that he made the first movie, but I'm also under the belief that we reach a certain point where maybe our create creativity just becomes zapped. I liked some really Scott movies, his early stuff I preferably enjoy. Everything lately I've really, really not liked, especially because he tried for a really, really long time to just keep replicating Gladiator until he decided to make a sequel to Gladiator, which we're getting this year. Nothing original in mainstream media anymore. And then they try to over-explain why the spaceship looks like the way it does in the original Alien movie. And for those that are not in the know, Alien is a 1975... Wow, 79. Totally just a loopy hour. Alien is a 1979 horror film set in outer space in the distant future where a ship trucking crew, that's effectively what they are, come across a... This, uh, come across a communication of urgency that forces them to deviate from their course, go down to this planet, and try to figure out what the distress signal is about, only to come in contact with an alien life form that may just be the perfect organism in killing. And we play ten little Indians as one by one. Each one of the crew members get killed off until we're down to one. I, I presume I didn't need to get that explanation, but you know, the people that probably make it is may need that explanation. So first alien is a classic in the sci-fi horror genre. It's sequel is equal, if not a greater classic aliens directed by James Cameron in 1986, adding in a lot of the lore that we now know and adore of the alien franchise. And then it all went to hell. First, Production Hell with Alien Free, which was a nightmare. How many scripts were written for Alien Free? They were rewriting the script as they were filming scenes, as David Fincher was filming scenes in 1992. Alien Free is notorious for the mess it came out to be. There are scenes I do actually really, really like in Alien Free and have no problem considering Alien Free part of a trilogy though I recognize it is a far weaker ending compared to the first two installments of that franchise. Then we had Alien Resurrection. They got a French act. They got a French director who was becoming popular and said, hey, direct this, pop your property. And the French director went, I don't do Alien movie. Why you, why you pick me? This is a bad idea. 
Oh no, it'll be great. It's bad when the director says you have done, you've made a bad decision. I don't think I have to say anything more about Alien Resurrections. It did not resurrect anything. And then things went dormant. A lot of video games were made. Some really good ones like the Alien vs. Predator games. Some not go so good ones. Looking at you, Alien Colonial Aliens Colonial Marines. We got a really good survival horror game in Alien Isolation, which the game journalist did not understand that it's a survival horror game meant to cause suspense and terror, and it's not meant to be easy to play. And yes, there's going to be backtracking because you're on a space station. There is an end to the space station. Hmm, how are game journalists doing currently? Just let me know in the chat. Are they doing good? I, I, who knows? Moving forward... Ridley Scott announced, I am going to bring a prequel trilogy, which was, oh, it's not, we're going to go and talk about how all these androids created the Xenomorph because he wanted to play God. Not that the Xenomorph for an actual creature that had been around for hundreds of years and there's been extended universe lore building up about this in the alien home world. No, 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 no. Just a byproduct of an android, of Michael Fassbender playing with flutes and playing with God. Uh, his trilogy never got finished because Alien Covenant was boring as all hell. And now we're getting this. Alien Romulus. Which I presume Romulus is referring to the ship itself. Now, to be fair, the sets look pretty appropriate. Looks like we're actually going back to the original. Again, why is the prequel to the original movie look more futuristic in technology than the original? Again, and he's also trying to... I, I swear I read some of the Ridley Scott said, oh yeah, Blade Runner and Alien, it's the same universe. That, 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 no. No, that don't make sense. You got all this... You got all this analog tech in Blade Runner and the original Alien franchise. That adds up. What we see in Prometheus and Covenant does not. <laughs> so, pros to looking like the set. And Fede Alvarez was the director of the Evil Dead remake. I have mixed opinions on that. And Ridley Scott's producing. Great. I don't trust this movie because Scott's tendrils are on it. Oh, it's getting spoopy. Oh, we got blood with the with the space pod with the sleeping pods. I'm so spooked. Ah, oh, uh, that's freaking CGI face huggers. Ah, why do we need four or five of them? Oh, why can't I have practical effects? And if those are real, if those are practical, then they look really crappy. Nah, those are CGI. Look at the blur. That lighting was pretty good, though. I like that atmospheric lighting. Throwing flares. I don't know what that's going to do. What do we got? Heat-seeking aliens. What are these? The Shriekers from Tremors 2? Ooh, creepy crap. Zero-G stuff. Hey, explosion space. That don't happen. More face huggers. They're just flying all over the place. Like, how many face huggers do you have in this? You don't need that many. The original movie, there was one, and it killed the whole crew. I mean, well, you know, the face hugger killed Kane, and then it burst out Kane's chest, and then it picked off the crew one by one as a full xenomorph. But still, you know, there was that big tense fight in Aliens, you know, when Burke releases the two face huggers when Ripley or Newt are asleep, and there's this whole fight trying to pin down the face huggers before Hudson comes in and just freaking just machine guns them the holy hell. Now we just got them bouncing all over the place. I am wondering, I don't know if they're going to do it or not. Almost looks like just how the movement is. Maybe they're going to try to do like something like 1917 where it looks like one continuous shot. Interesting gimmick if they do that. I don't know if they're going to do it though. Oh, look. It's not Ripley again. Oh, look. 
It's not Ripley again. Ri Look, we got the pulse rifle. I'm not Ripley, I promise. Ugh. I don't give a crap about this. Well, I do, because I love this franchise, and they just won't let it sleep. <laughs> let it sleep. Let it be dormant. Let it have a good, long, permanent rest, and we will respect it in its peace. Yeah, I hope them seatbelts were buckled because that was a that was not a good ride. No, I love the Alien franchise. Saw the first film way probably way too young. I, I, I think I saw one was like four years old. I saw a lot of I saw a lot of movies that I was probably way too young for. But I know I turned out completely fine, didn't I, guys? Right? No, I loved loved the original movie. I saw Aliens first, and then I saw Alien. Most of my family are strictly aliens fans they say that the first film was too slow i love both films equally they go hand in hand if i had to choose one i would put aliens slightly above the og and i mean it's very slightly just for the nostalgia but both films with a game with a gameplay of alien isolation in between great time great great way to spend halloween i'm tired of the disrespect this franchise is given but you know and much greater, much better news. At least while all of these franchises that we respected and loved for so many years are being murdered one by one by mainstream media, we got independent creators making new stories that we can invest it in. And one of those is Bonzar Bokel. Uh, if you do not know who Bonzar Bokel is, Bonzar Bokel has created a multiverse. I promise you, this is a good one. <laughs> called the Association of Ishtar. And as much lore, he has built a ridiculous, intricate world out of this. It is actually relatively easy to get into. And the reason is, what you need to understand is that it's kind of set in Victorian age, you know, late 19th century, turn the 20th century. It is a steampunk world. Well, there's some also diesel punk front in there as well. And it's about this entity, this organization that is able to communicate across universes and they combat anomalies things that bleed from one universe over into the other so pretty easy to understand what's going on in the overarching world and all these entries are just vignettes into characters evolved with the association or have interactions with the association and i actually got i did have a couple oh it's over here underneath my notes huh. Huh. funny of it funny yeah. small world i got Two of um, Bonzar Bogle's works over here. We got Bound for the Sticks, which was one of his major novels that came out last year. And just recently, he released the... Gotta love this. And won an adventure about responsible doll ownership. Gotta love it. It's a steampunk no novella about, about, about a doll that comes to life. Like, oh, it's so cute that it's creepy. <laughs> so yeah, I got some of his stuff here. And he's releasing a new project right now. And I'm going to go over and share that. And that is going to be called Casket Girls, which is being championed as a steampunk mecha adventure. I, I like mecha. I like big robots. And I really like steam power. Huh. Who knew that Readout Productions really, 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 really likes steam power? Like, what What gave it away? I, I don't know what gave it away to Readout Productions is all for reading about mechas powered by steam <laughs> okay back to the back to this yeah, that was funny while it lasted an illustrated novella about mecha pilots fighting alien invaders from other realities in a world of steampunk and cosmic horror and got funded in seven hours yes big following he he is building i i am so excited for more stuff that he brings to us let's read a little bit more do you love steampunk and mecha battles? Do you enjoy settings to immerse yourself with new things that discover beyond every corner? Help us fund this special edition for Casket Girls. Amidst the ringing of gunshots, the cabin's temperature was on the rise. After wiping the sweat off her face, Maria pulled the levers, making Pepite, uh, her battle frame, walk up the steep rocks. Finally, she reached the top. The monster's pitch cries reverberated between the cliffs as they stormed the pass below. Ah, I want to read the rest of it. I guess you can't have to back it. Uh, okay. 
Okay. All right, computer, I get the hands. You want me the back. It's, but my wallet says otherwise. But I'll talk about you later. Who will love the Casket Girls? Any fans of Battletech, Land and Sea, Warhammer 40k? Praise be to Space King. Pulp, Steampunk, Dieselpunk, Cyberpunk, and Ghastly and Fantasy. People who read paranormal, mystery, war fiction, and or alternate reality. Why did I read his ultimate reality? Man, I'm getting loopy. If you enjoy an ensemble cast living through missions against various alien life forms set inside an alternate 19th century, then this novelette might be for you. The Cask of Girls is a steampunk novelette, 190 pages plus illustrations, set in the Association of Ishtar Universe, an alternate 19th century universe where anomalies called rifts are opening up all over the planet. Most of these are harmless portals to alternate realities, but some are gateways for alien creatures to come through, called weird beasts. Whenever the local 40s can't contain these anomalies, penal battalions are sent in to terminate the threat with the help of automa automatons piloted by casket girls. I wanted to say Autobot so badly. Female convicts fighting for their freedom. Freedom! Shouts Mel Gibson. And there's some, you got the basic cover, the backers edition. And he's also really getting into making uh, 3D printed figures. So hopefully one day you can tabletop RPG this. For the fans of the Association of Ishtar and members of the Anwen Army, we have a limited number of plush Anwen keychains. You can find these already add ons. Those better. Oh, they're, uh, they're already gone, aren't they? Only 10 add ons available. Or, I'll have to look. I hope it's still available. I would really. Ah, of course. What else would I want than a a doll that gains sentience and sometimes speaks to ingrain and totally does not seem weird? Black eyes, like a doll's eyes. Ever wanted to have your likeness included in a book or comic? Or you just want to be awesome drawn by our illustrator, Johan Alexander? Check out Get Drawn in Tear. Essentially, that means after you back on that level, you will become part of Casket Girls or a future work. So yeah, Casket Girls is a new installment into the Association of Ishtar, a fascinating universe that Bonds Arbuckle and other creators are collaborating for. I am going to drop the link in the description below. If this is interesting you and you want to go back it, I highly recommend it. But folks, that's going to bring an end to this night's stream. Partly because, man, I'm sorry, I can't English. You know, I can't English on an any, any week. I usually yinzer, not English. I can't even yinzer tonight. Hmm, I'm just kind of tired today, I guess. I don't know. Did a lot of filming today at a free day. So trying to get a lot of stuff filmed. And then next month is going to be a lot of editing because I am not going to be able to go to a lot of places the next couple months. So March was about filming. April, May is about editing. So a lot of cool stuff coming down the pipeline. What's coming out immediately? Well, this Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, new installment of Retracing History is coming out. Be sure to go and check that out. It'll be us exploring America's first railroad tunnel. It'll be about a 18-minute trip to see this tunnel. It was more like a two-hour round tour for me because the tunnel is two and a half miles from the parking lot. But it was a worthwhile track. And I, when you get to see the video, it was well worth it in the end. I really enjoyed it. Uh, in the near future, sometime this spring, we will be releasing a trilogy of Retracing History videos relating to the Philadelphia campaign. This is the series of battles fought between George Washington and British forces in 1777 and 78. I say British forces because it was technically two commanders. First, he fought uh, General Howe in September and October. General Howe was successful in capturing Philadelphia, but he was unsuccessful in destroying Washington's kind of army who sought refuge at Valley Forge, where they were trained and went out and fought the British Army the following spring. But they didn't fight the British Army came by Howe anymore because Howe had been fired. Well, he retired, as he said. He resigned. He, he, he was fired. And he was about to have a very long inquiry with the British government and replaced by Henry Clinton. And Washington and Clinton would fight at Monmouth. Ah, see, it all ties full circle. So there will be a trilogy of videos 
videos of us visiting certain sites relating to that campaign coming out in the next coming weeks. I don't know precisely when. A lot of editing involved in that. Looking forward to get that out. And just so you guys are aware, there will be no Uncut History next week. I'm going to take the week off next week to enjoy the holiday. But we will be back here in April, first Thursday of April. We will have all sorts of fun stuff to talk about. Now, before you depart, I got to go over and see what the poll was. I'm going to go judge you guys intensely. Uh, yes, me, the total NASCAR fan that totally just only watched NASCAR for the pretties Kel when I was four years old. Let's end our poll over here when the tube you actually gives me the chat. And while I wait, this is a good time to remind you, before you depart tonight, consider hitting the like button down below. Wherever you're watching, on Rumble or on the tube you or on the hate book, we are there as well. Hit the like button to let the algorithms over there know you like historical content. You do like to be educated about history. And if you want to be able to follow me on all my future adventures, consider subscribing here to Readout Productions, both on YouTube, Rumble, and Facebook. And if you want to go the extra mile and support me, go buy me a cup of coffee in Kofi. The link is in the description below. And also for Kofi is our membership program where you can join the garrison and you'll have access to select scripts, including notes from tonight's stream. So I will be posting them at a later date. I have to transcribe them from pencil to digital text. Sorry about that. So you'll get access to select notes. You'll get access to select scripts. You'll get access to digital postcards. So some photographs behind the scenes from my travels. And our poll. 80% of you said, why are we talking about NASCAR? 20% said Richard Petty. So we're going to say Richard Petty was the technical best driver in NASCAR, which is the correct answer. All right, guys. Hey, thank you all for tuning in tonight. I hope you had a great time. Uh, we won't be able, I won't be seeing you guys next week. So have a good holiday. Have a good Easter. And we will see you in the near future. Yes, we'll reel around the flag. Boys will reel it once again. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. We will reel it from the hillside wall. From the plane, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The union forever, hurrah, boys, hurrah. I'm also required by a Mogwai to remind you that this Sunday on the Hetero Pro Media Podcast, our sister channel, we will have a special panel to talk about Mocking Jay, the final in the trilogy of the Hunger Games. Why did I agree to this? Find out this Sunday for the Hetero Pro Media Podcast. We are springing to the goal of